afternoon. Welcome to the Senate Environment and Natural Resources Policy and Legacy Finance Committee. Today is Monday, February 25th. Um, today our first bill up is Senator Ralph, Senate File 1033. Welcome to the committee, Senator Ralph. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, can someone move the bill and then we have an author's amendment or which way do you want to handle it? Um, we don't need to move the bill, but oh. if you'd like to, we can move your author's amendment if Th you'd like. That'd be great. Senator Weber moves. Um, Senator Ralph, can you just, we don't have that. It's an oral amendment. Can you tell us what you're doing? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. The, uh, 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 Mr. Knopf can do that if you'd like. Uh, well, <laughs> Madam Chair and members, um, what, what I think, the word townships is, uh, is used here. We commonly refer to them as townships when they're organized, but it's actually a geographic area. When we, in the statutes, we refer to them as towns, but then there are also unorganized areas. So I think the best way to deal with this is to, on uh, 1.6, delete townships and in insert towns and unorganized areas of counties. So that way you pick up the areas that those township uh, locations, those six square mile areas with the, uh, or 36 square miles, excuse me, areas um, where they're unorganized too and the county handles the, uh, all of the public services or whatever for, for the area. So to include, that, this basically would just exclude cities then, um, or in, would mean that cities are included, they're excluded from the amendment, but, but it, would, uh, it would make sure that all towns and unorganized areas would be, uh, uh, it wouldn't apply until the uh, new PCA rules. Thank you, Mr. Knopf. Members, are there questions? Uh, Senator moves, uh, Weber moves um, the oral amendment to 1033. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, motion carries. Senator Ralph, to your bill. Uh, thank you. Uh, this bill is, is basically to relieve townships and the uh, unorganized territories that were added from the, bur the, the burdens of the uh, obtaining a special permit for what they call MS4 uh, systems. This, this deals with stormwater treatment or st stormwater runoff. So I have here uh, Steve Simmons. He's the uh, town one of the, from one of the townships that are in my district, and I'd like him to just talk about just a short period about the bill. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Please, Madam uh, Chairman, my name is Steve Simmons, and I'm a Minden Township Chairman. Uh, committee members as well. I uh, look forward to talking to you for just a moment here. Uh, we have been a member of our MS4 permitting to, since 2006, when they first started out for the township areas. <coughs> and during that time, we have accomplished a lot. Uh, the requirements that MPCA has put forward to us has been good. I mean, it, it's been hard monetarily to do that as a township because we don't have a lot of extra revenues. And we don't you generally have any individual that can take care of that. We either have to hire it or do it internally. And uh, we have chosen in Minden Township to do it internally for the most part. We had hired an original consultant and then after the first permit was finished, then we, we took it over ourselves and, and worked through the second permit process. Now, we're going to start the third permitting process. Uh, it's in process right now and they have passed. Uh, the new permit, we have to just follow, get the new rules set up. But uh, we're looking to be compliant, and the program has been a good program. What we have identified all of our culverts and our wetlands and water flows, so we know where water will move. And so I think that if we are allowed to uh, be the similar to the counties in their res respects of what they do, then we would be satisfied that that would, would work for all the townships. It would take care, it would eliminate all of the agricultural areas that we are, have no regulations in anyway, because that's just outside of the parameters of the MS4 programs. So we're looking to be similar to what the counties are, as what the bill states, and uh, look forward to this being passed. There's no objection from the MPCA or the cities, so I think that we're in good stead here, that uh, I don't think you'll have any conflict if you would go forward with the bill. Thank you. And Senator Alf, I do believe that um, um, at the end of session, this was included in, in the overall bill last year that, w that ended up being vetoed. So this is nothing new to our committee. Members, are there questions? Well, hearing none, uh, Senator Ralph, this will be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. And thank you very much for coming today. Thank, thank you. you, Madam Chair. Uh, next on the agenda is Senate File 1505, Senator Matthews. Okay. 
thank you, Senator Matthews. It's nice to see you on the other side of the uh, table today. So welcome uh, to that side. And um, I believe you have an author's amendment. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. It's good to be here as well. I have uh, Senate file 1505 and somewhere in this pile is my copy of the A2 amendment. Here it is. Ma uh, members, Senator Matthews moves the A2 amendment. Can you just maybe give us a brief overview of what that does? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we worked through this bill um, from its initial uh, introduction with some of the um, questions and discussions that were raised about it. Wanted to make sure that it was narrowed down, that it was more targeted uh, directly to uh, what we are trying to get at in the law. Um, there was talk, discussions with council about how some of the verbiage uh, could have been a little too broadly and we wanted to make sure we honed in on what we were discussing. So we helped work through with council and with some of the testifiers working here to, uh, to trim down the language, make it concise, make it directed at what the goal of this bill is, so. Thank you, Senator Matthews. Any questions on the A2? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. Senator Matthews to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have uh, some testifiers uh, with me that are here to discuss the, the nuances of why this is an important uh, issue, uh, why this, we're bringing this bill forward today. So I'd like to turn it right over uh, to, uh, to Christine. Thank you and welcome to the committee. Thank you so much, Chair Rood, and hello, committee members. I am Christine Coughlin with the Humane Society of the United States. And I have appreciated the opportunity to speak with numbers of you about this uh, issue and would like to extend my gratitude as well to the bill authors who are on this committee. We encourage your support for Senate File 1505. While a 2016 federal regulation bans most interstate trade in ivory, federal laws do not address commerce within states. This bill presents a wonderful opportunity for Minnesota to complement and mirror existing federal protections and to make sure our state is not contributing to the global poaching crisis facing elephants and rhinos. I'm pleased that today we have an expert on the issue with us. Iris Ho is uh, here from the Humane Society International. She has direct experience and knowledgeable on just about every aspect of this. So uh, thank you again and we would encourage your support for Senate File 1505. So welcome to the committee. Uh, please identify yourself for the table. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair um, and members of the committee. My name is Iris Ho, uh, representing Humane Society International, uh, which is the global affiliate um, of the Humane Society of the United States. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to testify in strong support of Senate File 1505. Um, and I also like to take the opportunity to thank um, the authors uh, who sit on this committee. J. Anthony Anderson. Age 66, Wapasha, Minnesota. Zheng Yiwei, age 43, St. Cloud, Minnesota. While you might not be familiar with these names, for those of us who track wildlife crimes, we are. Minnesota does not have wild elephants or rhinos. However, the state is not immune to ivory and rhino horn trafficking crimes. In 2016, Jay Anderson smuggled an antique dealer pled guilty to smuggling elephant ivory worth at most $100,000. That same year, Zheng Yiwei, a professor at St. Cloud University, was convicted of elephant ivory um, and rhino horn trafficking worth at most uh, $1.5 million. As the assistant U.S. attorney um, who presided over Jung's case, she said, cases like this are important to curb the market for rhino horns and elephant ivory to help ensure the survival of these species. Senate File 1505 would do exactly just that to make sure that Minnesota does not become a safe haven for wildlife criminals. While federal laws eventually ensure justice uh, for, for in these cases, 
state measures are very critical to close um, the loopholes and comp complement federal statutes. As Christine uh, mentioned uh, just now, uh, the, the federal statutes Endangered Species Act prohibits and regulates the import export and interstate commerce of ESA listed species. It does not regulate intrastate sales of ESA listed species. Therefore, it, it leaves vacuum for illegal wildlife trade to flourish in the states. And as a matter of fact, federal statutes are designed to allow for complementary state measures uh, to prohibit the sale of wildlife products. The Fish, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service actually directs individuals who wish to sell uh, wildlife products, ivory products, to check with state authorities to ensure that they are in compliance with state and local laws. And to this date, nine states have prohibited the sale of elephant ivory and rhino horns. But elephant and rhino poaching are not just about animals. Um, it's, it's, it's also about threatening national security. Um, we're talking about extreme um, groups, terrorist organizations like Ashabab um, or Lord Resistance Army. They have been found to engage in elephant poaching and ivory trafficking. Uh, criminal syndicates, transnational criminal syndicates who traffic in ivory and rhino horns also have been found to traffic in humans, narcotics, and other illicit goods. Indeed, many countries, including China and the United Kingdom, they have shut down their domestic ivory markets. And our research uh, done by our volunteers um, and also um, other investigations have found a persistent uh, ivory demand and rhino horn demand across the U.S., including right here in Minnesota. Um, uh, committee members, I have done uh, multiple investigations um, all over the U.S., um, in Asia, and also in Africa. And I have stood in the middle of Central African forest and met with elephant poachers and ivory traffickers. And I can assure you that they will not stop until there's no demand for ivory. And until that we recognize that the only value that ivory has is on wildlife elephants. And this bill is about the collective action that Minnesota can play in the national and global effort to save elephants and to combat ivory trafficking. Um, and I urge you swift passage of this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I believe there were a couple more testifiers on the list, but these are the two that had been in contact with my office ahead of time. So I'm open to um, either questions from the committee or the other testifiers, whichever you prefer. Okay, members, are there, are there questions? Senator Lang. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is, uh, I don't know if Senator Matthews, if you got a, I got a couple of questions here. Um, you know, and I, I looked at this bill prior to coming to, uh, to your desk probably, and there's a couple of questions that came into my, uh, my thought process prior to that. Uh, 200 grams, why the 200 grams? Is that a, a specific amount? Um, yes, if I may answer. Okay. Um, so two hundred, the, the 200 grams uh, came from uh, the federal uh, statutes. Uh, so this this proposed le legislation essentially tracks uh, what's uh, what's with the federal statutes exemptions uh, under the federal law, and we just want to make sure that um, the two the state the proposed legislation and also federal statutes are aligned. What was Senator the reason Lane. for that? Um, okay. Oh, Mr. Stanley. Madam Chair, members, uh, the 200 grams, my understanding is that that was developed in response to concerns that the piano keys from a standard piano not be caught up within the prohibition. So that's where that came from. Yes, thank you, Senator and, and Stanley. Yes. Madam Chair, <laughs> Senator Stanley. <laughs> Mr. Lang. Oh, sorry. Okay. See, I'm not from here, obviously. Uh, and then I, I'm guessing this is, he's going to probably give the same answer as far as where this, this uh, the 100 years old came from. But I, I mean, I'm just guessing I have uh, antiques from the World War II era. I have what I would consider antiques from the Vietnam era. And I have a car that's a little over 20 years old that qualifies as a collector. So why 100 years? Is it just because it's a nice round number? Yeah, so, 
Yes, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, so again, um, under uh, the federal um, ESA Endangered Species Act, there's uh, a, an exemption for uh, antiques, uh, which are defined as 100 years and older. Um, so again, you know, that's where um, we're tracking the federal statutes. Okay, so Senator Lang. Just to be in line with the federal. Exactly. Thank you, Madam Chair. And then one more. Um, how, well, this is gonna go hand in hand, I guess. It's a two-part question again. Uh, how many intrastate sales happen each year? You, you alluded to a couple of them that happened, uh, Wabasha, I think, and the other one was St. Cloud, and those, those are the two that you brought up in my office earlier. How many are there right now? Ms. Hall. Oh, thank you. Um, nine states um, have, have intrastate um, ivory and rhino horn ban. I'm sorry, Senator how many Lane. incidents of? Oh, incidents. Yep. Oh, intrastate. Right. Oh, oh yes. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. The right way to phase that is how many do you possibly see us uh, in, in encountering? Well, so I talk about the two um, major cases um, that Fish and Wildlife Service uh, work in collaboration with the state agency to prosecute successfully. Um, but it's, it's, it's hard to predict, you know, how many we will see. I mean, without this law, anyone could be peddling uh, illegal ivory today or tomorrow. Um, so this is, you know, essentially also a measure to prevent uh, future illegal ivory being sold in addition to combat, you know, what's going on right now in the state. Senator okay. Lang. So in the two examples you stated, were they prosecuted under federal law? His so. Yeah. Yes, so they were federal cases. Because they were across state borders, right? Correct. Okay. Um, Senator Lang. So the, the, the agency that that does that would be the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. When it comes yes. to state uh, enforcement of this law, it would be the DNR, correct? Yes, 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 correct. What's the financial cost? What's the liability on the state of because of uh, them enforcing this? And does the DNR have the expertise and the capability of identifying these, aging the, these pieces? Do they know how to do it? Ms. Hall. Or Ms. Laughlin? I can see Colonel Smith in the background. <laughs> yeah. I mean, would it, it would it would it be appropriate would it be appropriate yeah. for the DNR to come up right. now and, and, yes. and answer that question? Welcome Matt. to the committee. For the record, Colonel Rodman Smith, Director of Law Enforcement, Department of Natural Resources. Madam Chair, uh, represent, or Senator Lang, excuse me, I've been going back and forth. Uh, <laughs> Senator Lang, um, you ask a couple good questions, and those are some of the questions we have. Okay. So uh, my intent today for my testimony was to be neutral on this bill and the department be neutral. We do work with our fish and wildlife partners, so the two examples that were given earlier, those were um, across state line sales that we did assist the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on. Uh, Helping with them, um, helping with that, um, they prosecuted it in federal court. Um, you know, we talked internally about what this would look like, how many intrastate sales there possibly are, and um, I'd probably have a better chance of picking the right Powerball numbers than trying to figure out. We don't know. Um, so, um, you know, I did run this this this, this bill past our federal partners. They looked at it. They said it was a. Uh, um, very good at closing some of the gaps that exist in federal law, that uh, there are other states that are um, adopting similar language. I believe I heard nine other states. And so, um, you know, it actually goes so far. So for example, in, in this bill, um, on, line, on, on the amendment line 1.10, um, it bans the sale of um, mammoth and mastin, and those are both extinct. Those aren't covered by federal law because they are extinct. Although the weather we had last week, and I'm sure <laughs> mammoth, you probably would have saw them walking around. <laughs> so, you know, as far as the fiscal implications, um, you know, we don't know, we have no idea okay. what this would be, and this would be something that um, if this were to pass and we do start getting into some intrastate work we would we would um, probably a little code that time we do um, the legislature has given us about 12 percent of our funding and enforcement is general fund and so this wouldn't come out of the game and fish fund or anything like that if this is the type of work that was done and 
we probably have a little bit better understanding down the road. Senator Lang. Well, it's fair enough. That's kind of the questions I was, I guess I never thought, I, I'm sure, you know, mastodon and mammoth are all over 100 years old. But, <laughs> <laughs> but that's, I kind of assumed that's what you're going to say, and then, and then the expertise probably would come from the federal, uh, the cooperation between state and federal agencies. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel. Are there other questions? Uh, Senator Matthews, uh, do we hear from you? Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Sengem. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, uh, I'm looking back at this 200 gram thing and, and the reference to a piano. And as I remember, uh, a gram is like a uh, one cubic centimeter, which is like a sugar cube of water. I may be wrong, but that's my memory anyway. I, so 200 grams, I'm just believing that 200, that a, that a piano keyboard is a lot more than two, 200 grams. The density Hall. of ivory, ivory has to be more than density of water. I don't want to get too far into this one, but, but, but can somebody help me there? And what's it, Mr. Stanley? Madam Chair, members, um, my understanding, I'm not a piano expert, but my understanding is that with most of these, it's only a little top part of each piano key that is laid on that is actually made of ivory. But, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, oh. or Madam Chair, Senator and, and to our staff, but it says is, is not made wholly or partially of. So Mr. Stanley? Does, does not the whole keyboard then become ivory? Madam Chair, members, um, the I believe the language that you're looking at, Senator, is on line six and seven. Right. It contains no more than 200 grams of prohibited animal part. That's the ivory. As a fixed component of an item that is not made wholly or partially, what this is designed to do is ensure that you don't have a, one big thing of ivory that's then just broken into a bunch of little parts that are each under 200 grams. And the way that it tries to prevent that, and I may be corrected by the testifier if they want to uh, expand on this, but the way that this tries to prevent that is by saying that you can't just have little 200 gram or less pieces of ivory. They have to actually be attached to something that is not made of prohibited animal part. So the 200 grams reference is not to the whole thing. It's only to the, that part of it that is comprised of prohibited animal part. Senator Sendum, does that answer your question? Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, barely, but, uh, and I, I'm not being facetious, but, uh, and, and the, other, the other one is documented to be at least 100 years old. I mean, what, I mean I'm mean, i gonna guess most pianos you can't document. Uh, so is there a presumption of innocence or is there a presumption of guilt? Mr. Stanley? If, if you, if you can't document, it's uh, 100 years old. Madam Chair, um, at, I believe that this is gonna be similar to how it's done at the federal level. At the federal level, the burden is on the person claiming the exemption to demonstrate its age. Now, there is no one set way that he or she can do that. So I'm looking here at the Fish and Wildlife Services uh, pamphlet on this, this and they say, uh, the person claiming the benefit must prove that the article is not less than 100 years old. Such proof can be in the form of testing using scientifically approved methods, oh my God. a qualified appraisal, uh, provenance may be determined through detailed history of the article, including family photos, ethnographic field work, or other information that authenticates the article and assigns the work to a known period of time. So it's essentially wide open as to what method a person can use to demonstrate that it's more than 100 years old. Senator Sengen. Well, thank you very much. And Madam Chair, I don't think most people are gonna do that with their piano. They're not gonna carbon test it or, or whatever. Thank you. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Sengen. Just in following up, this was one of the big issues that we did change from the original bill in this A2 amendment to the original bill the language that was provided that we first ran with had a very specific 
way of going at the 100 year old phrase and the more we dug into it the more uncomfortable i became that it was going to be very very difficult to meet that standard and we thought that uh, more in line with what council shared um, just a standard of simple documentation of 100 years old would probably cover everything we were trying to get at anyways so we we uh, loosened up the the language uh, in that respect Senator Sengen. Uh Thank you so much, and uh, thank you, Senator uh, Matthews. The, the, so I'm going to dumb it all the way down. Our, the, the question is, to anyone, are people going to be able to sell their pianos? Yes. Ms. Ho? Yes. Yes, if I may. Yes, uh, okay. Senator Sengen. Yes, there is an exemption for musical instruments. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Sengen. Members, are there other questions? With that, Senator Matthews, would you like your other testifiers to come forward? Yes, Madam Chair, that would be fine. There's just one more. Just one more. Okay. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair Committee. My name is Colette Adkins. I'm a scientist and attorney with the national nonprofit called the Center for Biological Diversity. We focus on endangered species protection. We have more than 16,000 members and supporters here in Minnesota. And I spared you all from an action alert from our members having them, you know, telling um, each of you about how strongly they feel about this bill. But please know that uh, protection of wildlife and the wildlife extinction crisis is something that our members feel um, very strongly about. Poaching remains a huge crisis for elephants and rhinos. I remember growing up hearing stories of having to uh, kill elephants because they're overpopulated. That's not the case anymore. Elephant populations are crashing with near 70% declines in Africa. Asian elephant populations are doing even worse, much smaller numbers in Asia. And rhino populations are considered critically endangered um, with very small populations. These animals are all threatened with extinction and poaching is a huge threat to them. This bill would provide an important protection by eliminating a financial incentive for ivory and rhino horn trade. Like you heard, intrastate trade is something that the federal law can't get at. We need individual states to step up and do that. So on behalf of our 16,000 members and supporters of Minnesota, I ask that you support um, this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Adkins. Are there questions? Thank you. Oh, Senator Sengen. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I've got too many, but I'm just kind of curious, and I, I will admit to not having read the nuances of the bill of way I should. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, I happen to know maybe a couple of people. One in particular has this beautiful elephant tusk, and this probably goes back to the 1940s or 50s. He was gifted that, and, and his father was actually. Now he has it, and uh, it's it's carved and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, one, you know, depending on your point of view, might think it's beautiful or not, but. Uh, they have no children. What are their options uh, at a point in life when they want to dispense of that thing? What are their options? Madam Chair. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Senjim, excellent question. Um, line 117 and 118 designates that it can be transferred as a gift or a donation or bequest. Uh, it is the sale that uh, this bill is targeting. So whether it's passed down, my understanding is, is whether it's passed down generationally and stays in the family uh, or an other gifting method are, are excluded from this language. Senator Sengem. Uh, Madam President, thank you, Senator Matthews. But on that donation one, could they, for instance, and this particular person might be uh, inclined to do this, could they donate it to a benefit auction? Um, Senator Matthews. Madam Chair, Senator Senjum, I would have to rely on other advice on that one. It's an excellent question. Ms. Holt? Thank you, and, Madam, and Chair. Madam Chair. We don't need to solve the bill. It's just, you know, this will float around for a while. It can be thought about. Yep, excellent yeah. question. Yeah. Well, for this particular, if I may, yes, for Ms. this Holt. particular uh, scenario, a fully carved elephant ivory tusk, that is not an antique. Uh, because if it's right. 1950s, that's not an antique. Um, so th this person would not be able to sell across the state lines. 
based on the federal ban. Um, so there's limitations um, under federal statutes uh, for this particular tusk to be sold um, under federal statutes. And, and so again, you know, our proposed, this proposed le legislation by Senator Matthews um, is to again align uh, with the federal law. Senator Sentum. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm not sure I understood. I would be inclined to think this particular person happens to be a male doctor who would benefit towards some, who donate it towards some cause, fundraising cause for cancer research or something like that. Would that would that be possible? Senator, yeah. Senator Senjum, I think uh, uh, we are not changing the federal law, and under federal law, they would not be able allowed to do that. Really? And so this just aligns the okay. state with the federal. So you're not really changing the law for their donation at this time because it would be the very same as what we have now. This would be for the intrastate. So um, that wouldn't change their ability at this point in time, I don't okay. believe. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Madam Chair, and and uh, that's an excellent answer. I'd also add to that, Senator Senjum, is um, the very end of page one is there are potential educational and scientific institutions that can also meet an exemption. So perhaps not an auction, but maybe some other type of educational ed organization that could provide um, an educational purpose for it or something would, would uh, be exempted under this bill. Senator Sendum, okay. Members, are there other questions? Thank you. Uh, Senator Matthews, any closing comments? Uh, Madam Chair, I appreciate the discussion. I appreciate the questions raised. I know this bill has at least one more stop ahead of it, and I'm definitely open to continuing to work on the issues or questions that come up for this. So uh, I want to thank members for the discussion and ask for your support. Thank you, members. Uh, hearing no further discussion, Senator Matthews moves that Senate File 1505 be recommended to pass as amended and be re-referred to the Judiciary Committee. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, motion carries. Thank you, Senator Matthews. Members, next we have Senate file number 1063, Senator Johnson. Welcome, Senator Johnson, when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Committee. Uh, first of all, I'd like to just uh, thank my co-authors, Senators uh, Weger and Rood, for uh, the co-sponsorship on the bill. We've got Senate File 1063 before us today. Uh, this is a bill that, when was brought brought to my office, really made a lot of sense. This allows a lot of coordination. Uh, between our watershed districts, our state, and those agencies that deal with that sort of planning. What we had before was a situation where you end up with districts and other agencies that are doing their own planning in their own little realms, or big realms in some cases, uh, and they've all got to do this redundant work. What this does was allow the communication, allow the assets, and allow those papers and research and what's been found to be shared between these agencies which is really an important step to taking it from the paper and the planning phase into actually getting those projects on the ground. So I think this is something that's way overdue that we need to look at. So we've got a couple of folks with us today uh, that would like to speak to the bill and to the importance uh, of what this will do for their work. Who would like to go first? Who would like to go first? Madam Chair, thank you. My name is Jay Riggs. I'm the district manager of the Washington Conservation District, and I'm here representing my elected board of supervisors as well as the Minnesota Association of Soil and Water Conservation Districts. Uh, Leanne Buck sends her regrets. She's on vacation, couldn't be here today. 
Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide comments on the Clean Water Legacy Act modifications. I'm here today with watersheds and counties and um, entities that we work with regularly and our, our partners in the local government roundtable. And we've used that process to identify efficient and streamlined approaches to surface and groundwater planning and management in Minnesota. Uh, we strongly support Senate File 1063. The bill provides for modifications that will allow soil and water conservation districts to move more quickly beyond assessing and planning to accelerating actions and implementation of best management practices on the landscape. This bill before you today is acknowledging previous policy and moves us forward to remove redundancies between state and local watershed planning and as a result, empower local government units to get more boots on the ground and work together on more activities related to improving surface and groundwater throughout the state. Uh, we know the benefits of this law because we have already completed multiple TM deals and uh, at multiple scales and are working on one watershed, one plan and can see opportunities for enhanced uh, synchronization of all these plans currently in place. And on a daily basis, we work with landowners and residents and see the benefits of the Clean Water Legacy Act through efficient prioritization efforts and on the ground implementation. Uh, we are currently partnering with six, 16 soil and water conservation districts, watersheds, and counties to implement the Lower St. Croix One Watershed One Plan and streamlining the connection between all of these different planning entities and efforts would help us improve our water quality through a comprehensive strategy that includes science, partnerships, and flexibility for conservation practices that meet the needs of local landowners. And we support this bill because the process provides an opportunity for us to identify shared priorities and implement efficient, scale-appropriate resource management. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Emily Javins. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Association of Watershed Districts. I've been in that position for one year, and before that, I was the Administrator of the Yellow Medicine River Watershed District, um, and we were one of the five pilots that tried out the One Watershed, One Plan. And while we were doing that, uh, we did find out some things that were working really well between the state and the local governments, and we found out a few things that weren't working quite so well that we thought could be fixed, and that was what the heart of this bill is doing. Um, there were basically three different types of planning efforts that are kind of doing the same thing that we think we could uh, reduce reduce that work. One of them is the watershed restoration watershed restoration and protection strategy. And that um, was a report that was put together. It was built on all of the intensive monitoring that the MPCA did, and they uh, created a wonderful model that took a look at um, what was happening in the water, in the stream over 17 years. Um, that was awesome that they did that. They even built us a tool then so that um, the technicians or really anyone at the local offices could use that model and uh, rerun it but apply different best management practices to the landscape during those 17 years that the model was being run. So we could add cover crops to half of the watershed and see what happens to the water during, that exact, during those exact same years. And then we could make decisions as to which practices would be the best to put on the land. Um, so that was what worked really well with the, with the state. They did, in, the, in their wraps process, did come up with a strategy of what we should do. They came out to the watershed, asked the citizens, uh, what water bodies they cared about the most, asked them what they would um, do to uh, be willing to fix it, and they, put, they went back to their office and wrote a plan. And then when we started One Watershed, One Plan, we were required by a different law to go and do that same thing, ask the citizens, engage them, what did they care about, and what were they willing to do to fix it. And we came up with our own vetted plan with uh, local people really sitting down and writing the plan. And so, but now we, we do have two plans um, that to say how we can clean up the water. And there's actually a third plan that the state is supposed to write um, in relation to the, the total maximum daily load study. So that was a gr uh, great thing that um, was done also. It determined how much nutrients or sediment could be in a water body so that it could still be swimmable and fishable. But because one, uh, there's another state law that says, well, once we know how much it can handle, we better write a plan. Um, so these three different laws that were passed at three different times are all requiring the same 
um, type of plan. So this would allow, if one is already done and it meets all the requirements of the other, can it substitute for it? And so that is that is awesome. And uh, another thing is uh, with the with the wraps and some of the other plans, it's kind of has this assumed. Well, it's been 10 years. We better redo it. Well, and this is saying. You know, let's take a look at it and see what parts really need to be redone, and and then make some smart decisions about that before we just start putting all that um, money in planning and assessing. Because we are at the local level, we are really getting antsy. Uh, we are so empowered to do good work, and we would love to see more of the Clean Water Fund and and those things, those funds go into implementation. We are ready. Let us run. And so this will be an important step to help us um, accomplish that mission. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Javins. Mr. Martinson. Good afternoon, Chair and committee members. My name is Brian Martinson. I'm the Environment and Natural Resources Policy Analyst at the Association of Minnesota Counties. I'd like to start by thanking uh, Senator Johnson for carrying this legislation. I'm here on behalf of AMC to express our support for Senate File 1063. This legislation will update statute so that we, the state, counties, watersheds, and SWCDs can operate more efficiently on coordinated clean water efforts. It provides more flexibility and access to financial resources for implementing clean water activities. And I encourage your support of Senate File 1063 to create a process of efficiencies across entities that are responsible for the protection and improvement of our natural resources. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe we had one more testifier. Ms. becker Kadelka. welcome. Madam Chair, Angie becker Kadelka, Assistant Director with the Board of Water and Soil Resources. Madam Chair, thank you for hearing this bill today. Minnesota's model of conservation delivery is locally led. And this bill reflects that as you heard from these experts today. The local governments that we go and visit every year around the state, we travel to learn what can we as Bowser do better, what's working well, what needs to work differently. And one thing we've heard uh, uh, repeatedly over the last several years is an expression of study fatigue, planning fatigue, and most importantly, public confusion. And that's around process, it's not around content. And so this legislation better aligns analysis, planning and implementation with the accelerated action, which gets us to cleaner water faster. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Members, are there questions? Oh, Senator Hall. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I think I just need a little clarification. So uh, on lines 215 and 216, when, it, when you, we we already have on 2.9 to 214, we're talking about performance-based criteria or what it was in the law, and now we just go to criteria. Uh, I guess this is given this would be to give you more flexibility in in what you're doing and not be only solely based on performance-based criteria. Is it, I, it's, I sometimes struggle with that, but that must be to allow folks to do more things to try and get to the end result. Who would like that? Madam Chair, members, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. So we completely agree that performance-based criteria is a really important methodology to distribute resources. However, there are some times that the legislature directs us to distribute resources and appropriations on other bases, such as uh, a natural resource block grant, which is appropriated and passed through Bowser to counties based on a formula, or disaster recovery when there's a, a flood, then that, those resources are not appropriated based on performance base, they're appropriated based on the need and where the flood was. And so this bill does not change any, uh, it does not change any authorities, it does not change any standards, it just allows the agency to distribute the resources based on how we're directed to do so. Senator Hall. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I got two other questions here as we go, as, as, just as I was reading the bill and uh, on page five on line, line 511 where we, we, it looks like we take out what we used as the volunteer surface water monitoring guide 
and we and, and I guess here's where I'll say I, what concerns me is now we're going ex ex exactly what's established by the commissioner of the PCA and I guess I, I, I kind of like the idea that we're we're sticking with more volunteers and what what public is putting in than relying on the commissioner to tell us what we should do but I, I guess this gives us a little bit different direction than what I think we normally did. Who would like that? Madam Senator, Chair and, and members, uh, the Appendix D of the Volunteer Surface Water Monitoring Guide is, uh, is an outdated reference. And so we were, it was suggested to us that rather than having guidance be in statute, that we take guidance out of statute so that it stays current. And so the replacement would be the, the Volunteer Surface Water Quality Monitoring Guide is, um, is a Pollution Control Agency booklet that was developed in uh, in 2003, I believe. Yes. And so this replaces it. The PCA has been in charge of this anyway, and so it, it just gets rid of an outdated guidance piece in statute. Senator Hall. Thank you, Madam Chair. And finally, I guess back on, on page 10, uh, it, it looked like, you know, on lines 10.13, it looked like we had a whole lot of public input and now we're just, it looks like we're just gonna inform, I guess th there's the word, I didn't missed it, and consult with the public stakeholders. That's the important piece I guess I missed. Otherwise it looked to me like you were just gonna tell the, the stakeholders what was coming at them. So I guess the consult piece is the important piece that I guess I missed and I'll I guess I answered my own question, I'm gonna answer it. But that's the important piece. I think we need to keep the stakeholders involved in this process and not just tell them what's gonna happen. So I thank you. Thank you, Senator Hall. Uh, members, are there other questions? Well, Senator Johnson, I wanna thank you and your testifiers for bringing this forward. I do believe that we had an extensive conversation on this last year also, and it had broad-based support uh, in the bill that um, this is another Groundhog's Day, so um, <laughs> I uh, appreciate the committee's uh, support and patience, and thank you for bringing this forward. And Senator Johnson, we're going to lay over Senate File 1063 for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Senator. And members, seeing no other business before this committee, we are adjourned.